We're going to be reading from Genesis 45. I call the sermon, Faith is the Victory. And uh, before I begin with reading it or, or, or going to the sermon proper, uh, how many of you know what flow is, the psychological concept of flow? Okay, we got, we got a couple that know what the psychological concept of flow is. There is no, there is no more wonderful place in the human mind than for it to enter into what is called flow psychologically. If you can enter into flow, you experience the world in a whole new uh, dynamic, in, in, a, in a way that... Um, I love kung fu movies. I love old kung fu movies. I, I own all the classics on my Amazon Prime, Enter the Dragon, one of the best films ever made. And uh, y'all will notice in, in the kung fu movies, and you may notice out in some people's front yards that practice Tai Chi, they're, they're bringing into focus is what they're doing. They're bringing, they say they're bringing chi into focus, but who knows what they're bringing into focus, but they're bringing something into focus. And I experience this uh, at certain times of study. I experience flow in video games. One of the video games that uh, is uh, uh, known throughout the psychological world of being able to induce this moment in people is Tetris. And what happens in flow and what happens in kung fu movies and what happens in people who love what they are doing, they enter this place where fear is gone uh, and m memory and muscle work together to create you at your most perfect moment because you are totally reactionary. Now, this doesn't mean you didn't have to train because we watch kung fu movies and what happens? You know, wipe on, wipe off. Why am I wiping on and wiping off? And then somebody throws a punch. Oh, that's why I'm wiping on and wiping off. I get it now, right? Christianity has this moment. Christianity has a flow moment, and the Christian flow moment is so far above every other flow moment, why would you want anything else? It'd be like trading heroin for some cola or something. And so it is a wonderful place to be, and I, wanna, I, want, to, I want to tell you how to get there. And I, I wish I could say maintaining it is simple, but if you know about flow, you know that flow itself is not easy to maintain. One distraction, you're out. And uh, in the Christian life, Every discipline that Christ teaches is to bring us into this moment. Because you'll remember, He's teaching them wipe on and wipe off. And they go out and practice wipe on and wipe off. They fail at wipe on and wipe off. And Jesus tries to bring them back and says what? Do not fear. Cast out fear. And in the Christian world, if we can cast out fear and exercise pure love, Christ love, not what the world defines, but Christ love. If we can cast out that fear, if we can ex ex project Christ love out into the world around us, then we become kung fu masters. And you can look at people and go, my kung fu beats your kung fu. And that's always fun. We're going to read from Genesis 45. We're going to read the whole chapter, so say seated. Uh, seated. It's, uh, it's a long chapter, and if you're watching from home, uh, put your heart into a position of reverence as we read from the most holy work, the handbook for human existence. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified. Terrified at his presence. Let me tell you, every time you let fear in, how many of you have stared at a dog bravely? What happens? The dog either cowers away or the dog stares back at you bravely waiting for somebody to break. No matter how big that dog is. And the moment fear flashes through your mind, what happens? He bites you. The devil's the same. The government's the same. And if you can cast out fear in perfect love, your kung fu 
beats their kung fu. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Now, I want you all to pay attention as we continue reading. That statement gets softer and softer and softer as we go. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. And do, there are things in Scripture you cannot ignore. And, and we teach things like do not lie, but the Kung Fu is somewhere else. Do not lie is wipe on, wipe off. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God, God, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Let me rephrase that. Everything I went through, every single thing I went through, every pain, every tear, every bloodshed, every moment of agony, all of it was for a much higher purpose that I didn't understand then. And now that I understand it, my life has taken on purpose. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh. Who is Pharaoh's father, according to their religion? Ra, God. Yeah. He made me, God made me father to Pharaoh. Lord of his entire house and ruler of all of Egypt, meaning he received the crook and the staff and the perhaps the double-headed of the upper and lower Nile cap for the full serpent look. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you've seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and he wept and Benjamin embraced him weeping and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them after his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and return to the land of Canaan and bring your father and your families back to me. I'll give you the best of the land of Egypt and you enjoy the fat of the land. You are also directed to tell them, do this. Take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings because the best of all Egypt will be yours. Brothers and sisters, stand and do not have fear. The best of Egypt will be yours. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts as Pharaoh and had commanded, and he also gave them provisions for their journey to each of them. He gave new clothing to Benjamin. He gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. And this is what he sent to his father. Ten donkeys loaded with the best things in Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they were leaving, he said to them, Don't quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's ruler of all of Egypt. <laughs> he thought your boy was dead. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived, and Israel said, Israel said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I'll go and see him before I die. If 
Father in heaven, we ask that the reading of your word will do its work and that you will speak to hearts and minds. Do it around me, through me, in spite of me, however it must be done. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. God has always blessed me with the ability to see patterns within patterns. Um, sometimes verges on the insane, but I see patterns within patterns. I will live an entire dream existence within the grain of wood, or I'll find myself lost in the labyrinth of a mosaic floor tiling. If you too have been blessed with the gift of observing the underlying logic to life, emotion, and the spiritual world, then the hand of God is not hard for you to see as it passes over and arranges the board of existence to His will. He is never absent, and He is never disengaged from the game. He is the chess master who cannot be overcome. He moves in what the Scripture calls mysterious ways. And he moves in mysterious ways simply because we cannot see the entire landscape of the checkerboard reality. We see it from here. And there's a horizon. We are convinced that the correlation of the tiles denote good and evil, black and white, light and darkness. We are convinced that we understand the game that we're playing. We're convinced of it. And yet, if we could enter into the third heaven and look down upon the board as St. Paul did, we would realize that the game is not anything like what we first supposed. It's not even the same game we think we're playing. The game from down here looks rigged toward the devil and his minions. Doesn't it? In fact, the Scripture tells us you're going to see this, you're going to see that, you're going to see the other. It's going to confuse you. It's going to scare you. There's going to be war and rumor of war. The earth's going to shake. Typhoons are going to come. The tidal waves are going to wash away. And you are going to want to feel scared, alone, frightened, and confused. But let me tell you, dear child, it's not the game you're playing. Stiff upper lip, hit up, fear out, go. The game from down here looks rigged towards the dominion, towards the satanic simulation. It does. How could it not? The satanic simulation acts as blinders or filtered glasses through which we view reality, and it has done so ever since we had the gall to eat of the tree and demand our own right to call what is good and what is evil. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 reminds us, now, now get, your, get your belts on. Some of you got black belts, some of you are still on blue belts, we're going to work on that. Your Kung Fu is going to beat their Kung Fu, if I have anything to say about it. How could it not? The satanic simulation gives us these, these false glasses, and they're not rose-colored glasses, they are fear-mongering glasses. Your own government uses it against you. You don't think the devil himself will? Let no crisis go to waste. Evil, evil. I can't use the word. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13, 12 reminds us, this is instruction from on high, folks. You are guerrilla warriors. You are the, 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 the Christian seals. That is what that God wants you to be, the highest, the most specialized service in all of creation. That is your dignity. That is your purpose. That is your goal. 1312 tells us, us who are down in the foxholes, thus who are ducking from the bullets, thus who are using our shields to put out the fiery darts of the enemy. Corinthians 13, 12 tells us this, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then... I shall know even as I am known. You hear it? Do you hear the commander-in-chief telling you, 
don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're looking through glasses that are distorting everything, and it's not real. My son walked it to show you that there is a bridge. There is something over the chasm of hell. And it's been laid down for you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid of what everybody else with the dark glasses are doing. The wicked prosper in the satanic simulation. They do, but they only prosper simulation stuff. You prosper in real things. The Bible tells us that too, doesn't it? Why would you sell your soul for everything on earth? Why not store up the real stuff where real stuff lasts forever? The wicked prosper in the satanic simulation. It's true. It's angering. And yet, from the heavenly position, the game looks incredibly geared toward God, not the devil. From this new... I was going to ask, come to me after service and let me know if God's ever let you see the board. From this new perspective, we see that even the satanic simulation is dependent upon the rules and dominion of Yahweh's reality matrix. This is the darkness of the satanic simulation. And those who can rise above it within their spiritual lives and their spiritual outlooks will walk this world like the kings and queens of Narnia. I, I wish I could say that this secret is one which sticks with you. I, I hope that it sticks with you. I, I've had to be taught this lesson at least three major times in my life. And the lessons were advanced postgraduate courses in suffering and faith. And each class that the Lord gave me in learning this lesson, each class was increasingly difficult and dependent on the lessons that came before it. There is no discipleship without discipline. Hebrews 12, 6-8 says this, For the Lord disciplines those He loves. And He punishes each one He accepts. And He accepts as children. Listen, listen again. Listen again. This, is, this, this, ought to, this ought to be on all of our armor so that when we're in the darkest of night, we can look down and read, for the Lord disciplines those He loves. And He punishes each one that he accepts as a child. I hope you're being disciplined. I, I really want you to hear that, for it is the entire sermon for today. If you are not being disciplined, then maybe you're not accepted. We've spoken much in previous sermons about how jo Joseph should go on and get his revenge. I told you that I, while reading it, I want him to get his revenge. He has been set up for revenge. Anybody with any sense would go, surely the Lord has put these in my crosshairs. Right? But that's, that's our satanic simulation training. And we need to shake all that off and we need to get into the Lord's reality matrix training, which overcomes the devil and his schemes by simply walking away. Most of us would have thought to ourselves, look, God's delivered our enemies into our very own hands to deal with as we please. Isn't God good? I am a proponent of free will. I am Wesleyan by, doctrine, by doctrinal alignment with my own spiritual experiences. I believe in apostasy, apostasy simply because I feel in my gut of guts that the moment I choose the other team, God will be the gentleman He has always been and let me do it. For free will is one of His most glorious and precious gifts, and He's shown throughout the entire Scripture He will not infringe on it. But I also believe that my free will takes place within the satanic simulation and is being watched from the heavenly reality matrix. I might be a knight in the king's army, but that only means that I can move my little horsey in an L shape in as many L shaped directions as I please. It's all up to me, all the L's. It's L's all the way down. 
I am free, but I am free within the confines of the satanic simulation for the moment. As Christ put himself and was born into it with us to overcome it for us, and after his body was taken and turned into something, we do not know what, but something beautiful. He walked through doors and traveled through time. Be nice to be rid of the satanic simulation. I am free. I am free through Jesus Christ but I am free as Jesus Christ foot soldier here in this dark world for this time period. And I got to be a man and embrace that or I got to chicken out and choose something else. I'm free, but I'm free within the confines of the satanic simulation or free within the confines, or I can choose to be free within the confines of the transcendental realities. Let me rephrase, rephrase that so no one is confused. I am free to be imprisoned in the false projection of Lucifer. That is what the Bible calls choosing curse. Or I am free to be set free from the simulation in order to submit, submit freely to the will of the architect of it all. That's called choosing blessing. I am a creature. I will never be anything more than a creature. I must humbly accept that position and know that for some reason this creature pulled at God's heartstrings so much, He allowed His divine Son to die. For what am I? I am a creature. And, but I'm a special kind of creature. I am a creature who, creature who has free will. But I also have a shock collar. I can run all around the yard all I want. But the moment I walk out of the yard, I will learn very quickly how far my free will extends. I have the free will and I have the right before God to build myself a Tower of Babel. But I should never fool myself into believing that uh, if I exercise that free will, that God will not exercise His free will and knock my little tower down. The satanic simulation traps me. It traps me in mind, it traps me in body, and it traps me in soul, and everything in it is a lie. Grasp onto that for a little bit. Body and soul, but convinces me at the same time, watch, watch our celebrities, watch our atheists, watch our oh-so-proud ignoramuses around the world as they brag about how free they are because they don't believe in this moral monster of a God. I'm as free as a bird to dismember my children. I'm free as a bird to lose my mind completely and break with observable reality itself. If I want to, I can step completely into the lie of the satanic simulation, one of, being, one of which being you can be any sex you want to be. The heavenly reality frees you from the deception by placing you into the real construct, which requires that all agents of free will properly, powerfully, and receive the life more abundantly which such faith provides that person. The secret of it all, the mystery, after receiving the gift, forgiveness, and sacrifice of Jesus Christ and receiving the Christ mind through the work of the Comforter which leads us into all truth, it is to literally live this life according to the law of love. And the law of love, once practiced hard and long enough, wipe on, wipe off, wax on, wax off, one day, one day you will feel flow. And it will feel, there are people here who can testify. Raise your hand if you can testify to when you have entered the flow, it felt like you were flowing down a, a river of Christ's blood into perfection. Flow is something. 
The secret of it all, after receiving the gift, forgiveness, and sacrifice of Christ and receiving the Christ mind through the work of the Comforter, which leads us into all truth, is to literally live this life according to that perfect law of love. Allow that law to free your heart of fear and exercise a faith which understands the simple truth, which is this. There is not a single conversation that you have that is not part of the plan. There is not a single relationship in which you engage yourself daily that is not actively or passively taking part in the eternal war. There is not one TV show, not one movie, not one book, not one concert, not one song that you enjoy that is not in some way a sign and milestone on the path to ultimate faith for one side or the other. What is ultimate faith? I want to know. It's, it's my life's journey. It's my passion. It's my romance is to find what ultimate faith looks like. And beware, when you ask God for wisdom and ultimate faith, He might teach you. Ultimate faith is when fear has been vanquished in the hearts of those who trust God with everything. It's as simple as that. It is as insanely difficult as that. When God has your all, He cannot take anything away from you. It was always His. And the knight of the round table presents his arms to the king in tribute. It is one thing to have a nice job and two cars, a large house, and a home theater and tell the world how good God is. It's quite a different thing to be able to truly speak of God's presence and His love while you're being kicked in the ribs. But what if? What if I could promise you? What if I could put everything on the line and bet you? What if I take all the promises of the Scripture and distill them down into couple of fathomable concepts. What if, in the light of all eternity, you could be absolutely 100, totally convinced and assured that being kicked in the ribs was for your benefit, for the benefit of your children, for the benefit of the people around you, for the benefit of the salvation of the world? What if, through the eyes of eternity, the agony that you are currently going through was necessary to adjust the war table for the purposes of saving as many as possible from the fate that is for all of us. One day we will know, and we will know as we are known. Right now, right now we have to exercise something called faith. It is as powerful as your eye or your nose or your sense of touch. It is stronger than taste. It is not blind faith I'm asking anyone to follow. I never will. I demanded better for myself. And I proved him o'er and o'er. The first step is to only leap that you'll have to make. Everything after that first step is an exercise in the promises and the assurances of God and putting yourself on the line for Him enough to finally figure it out. He will always be your safety net. And He will always restore to Job what was Job's. Listen to what the wise men say. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, all things work together for good. The heart of the man plans his way, but the Lord establishes His steps. And so we continue making as many L's as we want to make. The lot is cast into the lap. But its every decision is from God. Diviners and pagans, 
They try to cheat the system. That's why we're told not to do these things. It isn't that knowing the future is somehow God really hates you, knowing what's coming tomorrow, or what you're going to eat, or what you're going to plan, or if you're going to college, or if you're going to have a job. God doesn't mind you wondering about these things. What He wants is your trust in today, and for you to eat your manna from the ground of today, and for you to be happy with your manna from today, and know that manna will come tomorrow. And stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. Oprah wants you to manifest your desires by concentrating really hard on it. I say do that in one hand and you know what in the other. <laughs> Satanists worship the self and all of its bestial qualities and I, I'm really amazed at how much their writings sound good to a carnal mind. Demon rats are just the nice face of the satanic church. We all know that now. Even priests and pastors sometime err and cast lots to divine the coming of days. If we could know the future, if we, if we knew what was coming, if we could get a glimpse through the looking glass or peer it next week through the crystal ball, then our fears could finally be alleviated and we could be prepared for an unknown future. Let us divine what's coming. Let us cheat the gods. Let us read the tarot. Let us ask the letter board. Let us peer into the silver cup and let us roll our bones. Call now Samuel from the grave and let us seek counsel from the land of shadows. The sky is falling. The earth is melting. The virus is diddly. The war is upon us. The dark is upon us. The day is nearly done. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall divine the water and I shall manifest my own table before my enemies. And all of it trapped within the satanic simulation. We cannot see the game board as we would want to. I was going to say we should, but we're right where we should be. But that doesn't matter. Just like soldiers in the field under a commander, each one following their training and their orders properly, ignorant of what the other troops and their movements are doing, but trusting in the head and the source of order. All in harmony and all working towards the same end. It looks dark. It does. It looks hopeless. It does. But these elite troops, these Navy SEALs of the kingdom, they know that if they trust in the commander, then all their L's will work out right. If they believe in his battle record, which has been spelled out for us, if they trust him with their very lives, then following orders becomes not a burden, but the greatest hope and chance of winning the war that you have. Your family needs someone to have this kind of faith. I am thankful I had people in my life. I was surrounded by people with this kind of faith. And in fact, most of them are here today. Your family needs someone to have this kind of faith. Your children need you to have this kind of faith. When you have this kind of faith, the world begins to glow in colors that you'd never noticed before. The music of the spheres reaches down and cradles you in the angelic lullaby, even in the darkest of lion's dens. There is no need to divine, for faith has replaced fear and purpose has replaced meaninglessness. God has you. Even in pain and suffering, He has you. In fact, God might have you closer than you think when He feels most far away. But if you could choose blessing, if you can choose blessing when the satanic simulation is darkest and when it's working its hardest to convince you that curse is all that there is, then you will rise above that sorry kabuki theater of darkness and begin to grasp the grand and glorious nature of our indestructible and unavoidable path to God's great and final victory over it all. Here is faith that can move mountains. Everything, even your free will, is contained within the reality of God's good creation. You can choose the apple 
All of us have. But you get the thorns as well. If you choose blessings, though, you will watch the world open up with possibilities that are absolutely, positively supernatural and powerful beyond your imagination. Jesus wants to give a people power. He wants to give you power. He wants to give you phenomenal power that I'm scared to whisper in public. He wants you to be trustworthy with it before He hands it over. Jesus wants to give people power, but He can only give it to a certain kind of person. A person willing to be disciplined into a master's swordsman. God called me to preach His blessed Word to people. And He called me to do it in a somewhat unique way. This calling has forced my hand many times. When I would like to lay down and give up, I cannot. Not for very long. When I would like to curse the heavens and die, I know better. And I will not risk my soul on that nonsense. When horrible things have happened, I have had my fear tell me to run and never look back. How about you? But because I was being watched by hundreds and now thousands of people, I knew that I had to demonstrate faith even if I wasn't feeling it. That's how you start. It's how you begin. It is the path. And uh, sometimes you got to get up and public speak when you don't feel like public speak. Sometimes you got to go into work when you'd rather not go into work today. We're in the heat of the battle. And the Bible tells us that when we are in the heat of the battle, things are going to be so wicked that love is going to be a very difficult thing to churn up. How many of you have found it a very difficult thing to churn up in the last four years? We must. If you and I are to be the Navy SEALs of the kingdom, we must. But because I was being watched by hundreds and now thousands, I knew that I had to demonstrate something I had to put my life where my words were. Speak more about your God, people. You will find that just speaking of Him holds you to Him. Why do I tell you that? I tell you that because you need three things. Have I got time for three things? You need to begin to speak about all of life in the recognition that God is in full control even when you feel tossed to the raging sea. You need to speak that way to yourself in your mind. You need to speak that way to your spouse. You need to speak that way to your children. You need to speak that way to your loved ones. You ain't got to be obnoxious. Just in all things, recognize that God is there with you and God is in control. You need to have enough people dependent on you spiritually Dependent on you spiritually. You are the one who lifts them up. You are their pastor. You are their preacher. You're the one that gives them words of hope. You must have someone. You need to have someone. Mama calls it, find a pillow to fluff. You need to find a pillow to fluff. You need to have enough people dependent on your spirituality for you to feel pressured into taking risks for God. You need to force yourself into that uncomfortable position. There is no other way. You have to go to boot camp to get to fight. And then, once you have done all these things, to stand and to show the world your scars, your bruises, and your glorious armor that was crafted in the very fire of heaven and tempered in the blood of a God. The true saints that I have met in this life walk through hell like it's a playground. And you can always find them standing in the city square when the rest of the world is cowering like dogs. I believe it was Pastor Moody who once said something along the lines of this, quote, well, paraphrasing, if one man would give themselves 100% to God, that man would change the entire world. You don't have to be willing to do something great. In fact, if you're thinking you're going to get to do something great, chances are you haven't arrived spiritually to do something great. You don't have to be scared of doing something small. For God uses the weak things of this world to baffle the wise. You don't have to promise God that you will go into the most fearsome mission field in the world. 
All you have to do is always hold in your mind, God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. And I'm not afraid. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His promises are true, and every encounter that you have is a choice. Will you get yours, or will you give yours? Not my will, but thine. Atheists say they've never heard, uh, say they've never heard God, and that people that do hear God are schizophrenic. Well, get my jacket for me, because I hear him all the time and have since I was a wee little boy. And most of the time, he's disciplining me. I'm getting close to meeting a young man who met Jesus very much like I did. And some of you don't know my testimony, but I'm getting ready to meet a young man who uh, met Jesus the way I did. And because he met Jesus the way I did, he's been kind of cast out of some Christian groups. And uh, I want him to know that uh, somebody who met Jesus just like he did is now preaching the blessed word of Jesus Christ to the world. He has had people call him schizophrenic. He has had people uh, basically escort him out of churches that he didn't quite fit in, and others uh, not so nice to him. I'd like to say they call Jesus crazy too. Atheists have heard God. They just want their own way, and so they deny it. Anything that threatens their own concept of self, Sovereignty is to be hated by them. But for us, for those of us who find the will of God for our lives, for those of us whose compass of desire has finally found its northern star, in God we find full expression of not just our free wills, but our free wills joined with the willful intent to conform the rules of reality as set forth by the architect himself. And in so doing, we ride that line between freedom and service that we call the narrow way. The eagle flies because he obeys the rules of the wind. The whale swims because he understands the force of the waters. Humans become humans when we are submerged in God and we enter flow and nothing can stop us. It's a taste of our Edenic state. A human becomes the caretaker of Eden in that moment. He exercises the fearless faith of Sabbath, the warrior God, and the master of the game, Sabaoth. Let me see if I can sum up the entire Bible pretty quickly for you. If you will give God your prison, then He might give you a crown. If you give Him your comfort... He might bring comfort to the world through you. If you will give Him your soul, He will ensure it for all eternity. Faith is the victory. Faith is this. God loves you. Is working all things towards your good and has already achieved the victory for which you so passionately desire. To have this faith is to open yourself up to romance and to action and to tragedy and to comedy all rolled into one. To live this faith is to live life in all of its facets, facets both up, down, left, right, good and bad, and to realize even in the midst of tears, praise God's name forevermore. He's given me it, He's given me it, He's given it me. He's given me life and that more abundantly, all of it. It takes a strong and a courageous person to embrace life more abundantly. But for those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is indeed good, there is no other life worth living anymore. I have my faith in a king, and that king has told me some of his secrets. One of them is this. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Even our faith. My faith is in this. God loves me, and God is over all things. 
and Christ is king.